Coming up on this episode of Up for Debate, we're discussing... Matt doesn't remember the topics. This is a surprise to him. We're discussing idioms. That's right, your favorite common phrases. They have interesting origins and fun times. We're going to go through it all. It's coming up on a brand new Up for Debate. This is Up for Debate, episode 98, recorded December 20th, 2017. Idioms for idiots. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of of Up for Debate, the podcast that can talk about anything and often does. I'm Sean Jennings, joined by a man who would never throw the baby out with the bathwater. It is Mr. Matt Mariani. Well, Sean Jennings, uh, two birds in the hand are worth three in the bush or oh, something like that. Matt, it sounds like you're giving me the cold shoulder. Well, it looks like you are the cream of the crop. I, but, I, Matt, I think we need to bury the hatchet. Uh, oh, what, cat got your that, tongue? Yeah. Uh, it looks like I'm in a pickle. Et cetera. Yes, that's it. We uh, were doing idioms this week. That's that's the that's the that's where this is go- we need to really stop before we get too much farther into this. But uh, but yes, we, we briefly mentioned this on last week's episode. We talked about uh, don't look a gift horse in the mouth as part of our gift giving episode. And this ended up being a kind of a fun idea because we use these phrases all the time, and they're hundreds of and hundreds of years old, and we still use them even though they don't at all apply to our lives. And I love some of the stories behind them. In fact, Matt, one I know I use a lot, which is gangbusters, right? You've noticed Mm. I say things are gangbusters. I do it on the shows all the time when I'm talking about something really positive, and I said, where does that come from? Do you know where gangbusters comes from? Uh, My guess would be like a 1920s gangster source. That is ex- they used to go in and bust up gangs. That's very close. It was a 1930s radio program called Gang Space Busters, and that's okay. and that's where where the where the phrase came from. Some of those old radio programs, uh, I think they're worth a listen. I think if you have any spare time. Is there a podcast out there that plays exclusively old, uh, like broadcasts of old shows from from like radio shows? Well, I know a lot of them are archived, so you can just go listen to the original recordings. I don't know if anyone's done it in a podcast feed. I do know there are some podcasts, or at least there were, where they were trying to write new programs in the style of 1930s radio but for podcasts with the sound effects and the and sort of that sort of st- st- uh, storytelling style i don't know if hmm. that really caught on i like that i like that it was like when um when the artist came to theaters mm. i thought that they're you know they're the time i think people could have tried to, a, a little bit of a revival of silent film I would go to see a silent movie, wouldn't you? No, probably not. I think really? I think sound is a pretty big component. I would absolutely. Like after watching The Artist when it came out in theaters, I, I could have I could have easily gone into see a hundred silent movies after that. But it's one of those things where it's like I I it's good that they did it once in The Artist, but I couldn't do it like do it once really well. It reminds me of did you ever see a uh, Birdman? With Michael Keaton? Yes. So yep. how the film was all, it, or at least it was like edited to look like it was shot in one long take. I love mm-hmm. that. It looked so cool. But again, they did it really well. No one else needs to do it. Like I couldn't handle if every movie was shot that way, but it's just cool that they did it. No. Yeah, that, that was a little extreme, but it was great. It was great to see. I I, I don't think it would have lent itself well if like a whole genre developed that. Right. That. Well, that's and it, that kind of happened when like uh, Inception came out, which you know, cool looking movie, and they did some cool stuff, and then every other movie tried to rip them off, and it just did not work. Mm-hmm. So, oh well. Um, so now we're talking idioms. Do you do you have any any particular ones you're a big fan of? I've got a list here that we can jump in and dive into, unless you have some that maybe you use often or. Um, I've always wondered about one idiom, uh, when you usually when like, when you say that, um, when you say that, uh, somebody is turning a blind eye to something, Mm. 
I, I've always thought that turning a blind eye to turn a blind eye was an interesting idiom. Like, where does that come from? Um, I actually looked, I looked up the origin of turning a blind eye. Do you know where it comes from, Sean? I do because I read it on the web page, but I bet our listeners don't. So it actually comes from, uh, according to the, I have the Oxford, um, Oxford's uh, grammar source here, Oxford Grammar, and to turn a blind eye actually comes from uh, famous English naval captain or naval naval hero Hor- Admiral Horatio Nelson. Um, who during the Battle of Copenhagen in 1801 allegedly um, raised his telescope to his blind eye. He had uh, one eye was blind. He could only see out of one eye. And he put his telescope onto his blind eye, thus ensuring that he would not see any signal from his superior, giving him discretion to withdraw from battle. He's turning his blind eye uh, to whoever the officer in charge was because he wanted to stay in the battle and not withdraw. So interesting. I think one way we can kind of put a spin on this episode a little bit is I read through a lot of these today before in in preparation. And I'm convinced at minimum 50% of them are complete bullshit. Like they are just (laughs) made up. Like they didn't know where it came from. And so they just made up like I would do. Like they just made up something. Sure. And so I think we should rate these on a bullshit scale. Like how 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 BS are these? And the turn to blind like, eye uh, one I think it's I think it's a little bit bullshit. Yeah, I'm not I'm not buying I believe there was Horatio Nelson. I believe he had a blind eye. I just think and and the the phrase may even apply to him, but but this sort of like very specific story about a certain battle yeah. That he, that he used the telescope. Like, why would he put it up to his blind eye? Like, he knows it's blind. That doesn't even... Well, because he was... So he wanted to make it look like he was acknowledging his superior officer by, like, looking at his... Tel- so the officer's on a different ship, giving him orders, probably with a flag or, or, or something. Telescope, but he's holding this telescope up to the blind eye. So that he could basically, so that he could ignore the order to withdraw. But then, why wouldn't he just put but it up to his regular like eye? Like you could just fake it with working eyes. Yeah, I don't really know. Well, I mean, because then he can give the excuse like, "Oh, I was holding this." Well, then it makes him look like then, a dominant. Yeah, then he's like a dick or a moron. Like I don't, <laughs> I take your pick. Like I don't know which is which. I don't know. I'm maybe yeah. Matt, maybe you, you buy it a little bit more than I do. No. I really don't. I don't really buy that one. That was a, that was a stupid one. I, I just picked it. No, it's a it it's a cool story. No, I like the story. Like it's so it's such a weird story that I like it. I just don't think it's true, or at least at least parts of it aren't true. Oh, do you know where um the thing comes from? And uh. You know, you you're you're following. You're reading a mystery story, uh, and there's a trail you're following in it, and you're and you're really convinced that this is going to lead to something. That this this one character seems really suspicious, or this one motive is really, you know, makes a lot of sense for this character to have. There was a, they were accused of doing. It turns out that it's a red herring. Boom. The author yes. has falsely planted it in your path. Do you know where that... Why do we call it a red herring, Sean? Why is it a red herring? I actually do know this one, Matt, and I'm happy to tell you. And it's interesting because this is one of several idioms that relate to hunting dogs, which I think is fascinating. Barking up the wrong tree is another one where mm-hmm. um, hunting dogs chasing their prey up a tree um, and the dogs will bark even if the prey is no longer there. They're barking up the wrong tree. But the red herring uh, comes from the fact that Hunters would put out, uh, red herring horse being a type of fish, would put the fish out in the fields or wherever they were training the dogs and would try to distract the dogs with the smell of the fish as part of their training. And it would be a red herring, a distraction of the dog away from its actual prey. And they would use it as a training tool. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, indeed. And that one you makes a lot of sense. Uh, right. I, I see. I had absolutely no idea where that origin came from. I thought that was uh, that was a good one. That's a good one. Thumbs up for that. Word. Thumbs up. Yeah. No. That's a, we should use that one more. It's, it sounds very yeah, smart good, when you say it. A red herring. Now, Matt, I bet you know this one. Do you know where Bite yeah. the Bullet comes from? Um, I've heard a couple of variations. And the familiar with is, so, back in early times of war, so, like, uh, 18th century, 19th century wars, um, when surgery was being performed, uh, the, the patient would have to bite on a bullet to basically, uh, as a, as a means to control the pain that was, uh, going on during the surgery and also to prevent them from biting off their own tongues. Cause what would happen is they would bite so hard. They'd either break their teeth or they would bite off their tongue mm -hmm. um, to try to stop the pain. So they would give them a bullet to bite on. And that's where bite the bullet comes from. There you go. Very good. And that's a good one. I, I like that. It's kind of a, a unique one in history. I was thinking for a second there, like, but wouldn't they just break their teeth on a bullet? But, you know, I think the bullet uh, casings back in Civil War times, they probably were a lot softer metal than they are now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think... Uh, I think they might they might chip a tooth or something like that, but I don't think they would. Well, they would probably I mean, the least of your problem. Yeah. Also, at the the caliber of the like the rifle might have been bigger too. Mm -hmm. that, that, however, I think is was only in extreme circumstances. Usually, they'd get people good and drunk. They'd get people like real, real drunk before they operated on them, like the world basically. Mm -hmm. Um. But I guess that was if the if the whiskey was short or if uh, it wore off or whatever, they would give them that bullet to bite on. Usually, when they were performing amputations in the Civil War, gross. The American Civil War, yeah, very gross. Mm -hmm. Speaking of gross, Matt, do you know Mad as a Hatter? Do you know this one? Uh, my guess it's got to have something to do with Alice in Wonderland, right? Eh, wrong. Nope. <laughs> nope. It, it's 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 uh it's actually from the 17th and 18th centuries, well before the book was published. What it was is hat makers, mm. um, in France, used mercury for the hat felt. And the Mad Hatter disease oh. was the effects of mercury poisoning, marked by shyness, irritability, and tremors that would make the person appear mad. Oh. Which is screw okay. that is messed up so the the uh yeah the the uh lewis carroll author of alice in wonderland actually got it from uh existing idiom mm -hmm. yeah can you i you know you think oh hats there that's not a big deal that's that's a safe profession no it drives you mad drives you yeah. crazy literally makes you crazy <laughs> That is bizarre. They don't make them like that anymore. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, what else you got in terms of idioms? Oh, I Matt, I've got piles of them. Believe, believe you me. <laughs> bringing home the bacon, Matt. Do you know? Do you know where bringing home the bacon comes from? Uh, so, oh, you would take bacon. Bacon sometimes when you. Your person, your employer would run out of money. They would pay you with bacon. And then you'd bring it home. I like this idea that we make... Let's do this from now. Let's just make up our own like versions it. and see if they're better than the real ones. Um, yeah. No, Matt. Turns out that's not right. Sadly. Okay. Uh, no, actually, this dates back to 1104, if you can believe it. Probably one of the oldest idioms that I've seen in all these lists. It traced back to uh, Great Dunmow, which is a place. The prior of Little Dunmow awarded a particularly dedicated married couple with an entire side of bacon as a reward for their virtue. Such practices continued in the region, occurring every four years, 
and uh, and 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 did it for hundreds of years. I don't think they still do it, um, but that would that's what it would mean to bring home the bacon. Of course, it's it's changed. I would argue more recently, where bacon referring to more money rather than literal bacon. Um, hmm. But but that is where it began. It's interesting. Why why it's not a uh, you know why don't we bring home the salami or something like that. Well, but we, I guess now we know. Well, we bring home the Benjamins. We bring home uh, the we bring home stacks, fat stacks. Bring home the steak. Oh yeah, don't any kind of any kind of meat. You know, bringing home the, the chops, the pork chops. I made that one up. Nobody said bring, nobody. Bringing bring home, home the kielbasa. Steak. Nobody says that. Nobody says that outside of Poland. Bring bring bringing home the porterhouse, as they say. <laughs> How about some vegetables in here? Nobody's bringing home the broccoli. <laughs> bringing home the celery. It's got no calories. Yeah. Bringing home the lettuce. Nice. I like I like these. We could really write our own. Yeah. So, um Okay. I'll I'll go with the new one here. Let's see. Um yeah, you're right. A lot of these do have to do with hunting. Yeah, I thought I don't maybe maybe those were the those the people who were writing the books and recording these things. You know what I also I, I didn't really appreciate how many idioms there are. There are there lot. are hundreds, and Holy we know God. all of them, which is crazy. Self is an idiom. Jeez Louise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Do you know where? Um, yeah, this is pretty good. To read the riot act. Oh, to read the riot act. Yes, I know this one. Somebody the riot act. Yes, no, Matt. This dates back to 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 the late eighteen hundreds, um, when uh James P. Riot, um, <laughs> wrote a controversial book, um telling young women that they did not have to marry and they could wear what they wanted and, and promoted women's freedom in France back in the late 1800s. Um, and what would happen is uh, if people, if young women read Riot's book, um, their parents would be upset and would read them the Riot Act in, in defiance of what their young daughters were trying to do. Um. I'm not sure if any part of that was correct, but uh, it was creative. It was a little imaginative. I'll give you that. So actually, uh, there actually was a real act called the Riot Act. It was passed by King George the First. Oh, the best George uh, in 1714, uh, and um, it was it was read out loud in town squares in order to quell gatherings of subjects that the throne considered potentially threatening. Uh, once concluded, the rioters were given one hour to disperse before getting slapped with penal servitude and imprisonment sentences. So the riot act basically said, like, you are not allowed to riot. And it would be read and then an hour to go away before the uh, royals called the dogs, as it were. So that's yeah. the riot act. That makes sense. It's oh, pretty totally straightforward it makes a lot more sense than what i said i just didn't know that there was a literal riot act how about um how about this one painting the town red oh gosh oh yeah we're gonna go out there, we're gonna paint the town red yeah no this is a this is a really common one map of course this dates back to uh the late 1700s early 1800s uh when uh noted serial killer uh james p corney uh, terrorized London for two weeks uh, back in that time, and he would take his victim's blood and actually uh, and paint it over their doors. And he would paint the town. That's what they said. He painted the town red with the blood of his victims, Matt. And and that phrase still uh, holds true today. Enact his his heinous crimes every Friday and Saturday night as we go out onto the and party it up. Yes, in, uh, various clubs and such. Yep. Uh, and a memory to, to what was his name? Cornish is that Corny. the guy? James P. Corny. Corny. Okay, James P. Corny. Well, Famed um, uh, the Oxford people here they say that painting the town red 
actually, you, you had this part right. It was a maker, and it did play, take place in an English town. Uh, but, yeah, he, there's no evidence that he used blood. Uh, apparently, he's just he was just a mischief maker named the Marquis de Waterford. And he ran around the English town of Melton Mowbray, pa uh, painting um, various buildings, uh, a lovely shade of red. I guess that's what that's you did in crazy. 1830s England. He would just run around when while everybody was asleep, paint things red. People would wake up, they'd be red. And, but the, and he had fun doing it. But yeah, as long as he had fun doing it, right? <laughs> He's not causing that much harm, right? No, he was he was a hooligan, a scam. Basically, like a like a like a, a, a bank scene, like the bank of his day. Well, it it's like this is what I love about these idioms. That is like, why are we still talking about that today? That's such a minor thing. Yeah. Like, oh, I threw eggs and toilet paper on Halloween's on someone's house. Are they going to be talking about that hundreds of years from now? Like, that's bananas that that became a common phrase everyone knows especially because it was it's not like it was london or something it was this this obscure english town in the countryside like that has to be one of the greatest i don't prank. maybe it's not a prank it but has to be town, but... one of the greatest pranks mm -hmm. of all time if we're still talking about it yeah we've almost completely forgotten about mm -hmm. serial killer james p corny I don't know why nobody does that now. Like why people should be going, instead of making graffiti, go out and paint, paint things. Paint the town red. Different colors. And then people will be like, whoa, this building was green yesterday and now it's red? What? Like, <laughs> Matt, am I, I going insane? I what hope is it, happening? I hope it doesn't actually happen, but I kind of want someone to prank <laughs> your house just to see and you like you walk out in the morning you're like whoa this door was white yesterday heck? and now it's blue oh my god it would be crazy. <sighs> and then that katie's like nuts. no matt it's always been blue honestly i don't even think i'd be that mad if somebody painted my house and i wouldn't I didn't notice know about it i wouldn't notice it would go years and someone would be like sean wasn't your house a different color when the fuck did that happen <laughs> I had a giant they slowly just you know, little by little. I had a giant water stain in my kitchen ceiling for like a month before someone else I walked under it for a month before someone else noticed. I'm oblivious to things in life, so Wow. I would get busted. Now, Matt, I don't know if this is really I guess it's it's mm -hmm. yeah, this is an idiom. Do you know why we call things loopholes? Okay. Uh, I have hiccups now, apparently. Um, sewing, you have to create what are called loopholes in whatever textile you're sewing so that you can fit like little secret things in them. All right. And then you get away with it. Like the first ever loophole, mm -hmm. somebody actually stored drugs in a guy's pants loop, belt loop. That's little secret holes. That's that's basically right. I mean, you're like really? you're pretty close. Let me let me let me let me read you the actual answer, and then you tell me how close you were. I made that up. Okay, well let's see. A loophole comes from the Middle Ages. And it was a small slit-like opening in a castle wall that men would fire their bows or later musketeers through. The only openings in a seemingly impenetrable wall were these slits where a child or small adult could squeeze through. Thus, a, thus a loophole is a small opening or out in a seemingly airtight law, which only the clever few can use. Now, why were why do these loopholes and castles exist? This seems like a major oversight. Well, because you have to like attack people on the other wall. Some, I guess, maybe from the top, but they're so small, only a child or small adult could fit through them. Oh, so is it to they would have them in the castle so that the people inside could fire back? Yes, basically, defend defend the castle. Gotcha. It's not like a uh, Death Star situation where you've got the little, the little tiny um, valve <laughs> that Luke uses I mean, to destroy the whole thing. I, gu I guess that exhaust port was a loophole of sorts. Hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I, I didn't know it had anything to do with medieval castles. I would have assumed it had to do with, like, sewing or something. Yeah, it is really... I mean, it kind of... And in some weird way, it does make sense in the common way we use it in terms of like law and and things of that nature, where it's a it's a hole in the law that you can loop through. Like it's not like that weird that it's connected, but at the same time, it is. It's very interesting. Huh. Mm -hmm. This is this is riveting radio. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm looking up one particular. There it is. Okay. Huh. This is a good one. Sean Jennings. Oh, Do I know, you know the origin of that one. May 1991. North Adams, Massachusetts. Do you know, Baby boy. Uh, what it means. I have one that actually kind of segues into another one. Okay. Uh, we have first one. Uh, just a man. Where's that one come from? Oh, you from? you broke up while you were saying it. What was it again? Flash in the pan. Oh, flash in the pan. You know, Matt, I actually don't know the answer to that one. I can certainly make one up. Uh, flash in the pan um, is the story of back. Oh God, back during the Civil War, when uh, especially during the winter when rations were really light, the soldiers would have to resort to eating their own uh, bullets, and the bullets themselves they would cook them in pans. And because of the gunpowder, they would often uh, explode. And so it would cause a flash in the pan. Uh, it was very dire times back then. You're, you're really not too far off. You're oh. kind of, yeah, it does have to do with rifles, okay? Um, flintlock rifles would occasionally fail to light, um, light the powder, the gunpowder, uh, and thus would send a bullet flying in the opposite direction. So a flash, it was referred to as a flash in the pan, a quick something that was a quick burning, um, to represent a quick burning fad, um, would actually be the bright burning sparks that the gun created, which would last only a second and then result in nothingness. The bullet would just fly away on, on, uh, in, in, uh, the flash in the pan so hmm. like a malfunctioning rifle basically sounds very dangerous yeah it does uh, i mean i don't think that the so the the powder wouldn't ignite so it would just it would just kind of spark but it wouldn't ignite so the bullet wouldn't i think it would just kind of fly out of the gun but not not with enough force to hurt anybody so like it would go elsewhere right perhaps um this idiom kind of relates to i'm another popular idiom sean uh you ever hear that something is selling like hotcakes oh my gosh of course i have matt things selling like hotcakes um like hot cake. very popular i know the origin of this one um i think this this actually comes from the yeah. um comes from people who really like hotcakes buy a lot of them <laughs> and so they, they sell many because you usually like who wants one hot cake? I, I feel like it's a multiple item purchase. Well, hot cakes actually were at one time and I, I think they still are like the most popular food item. Like people will go nuts for hot cakes, like like nuts. Now, by hot cakes, we mean basically pancakes, flapjacks. Like, Flapjacks, uh, somersault, uh, uh, Jimmy John's, Jimmy Chang's, uh, circle discs, uh, 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 flatbread, vodka, uh, non. potato dish, uh, gabagool, whatever you call <laughs> Pop. pancakes. Yeah, um, all of those things, they're very popular. In this, in this nation's culinary heart. So to say something stone like hot cakes, it means uh, you better get them real quick or you're going to be without a hot cake. So, so that, that one literally has no origin or alternate. It's literally just hot cakes sell a lot, selling like, uh, so it could be like selling like any pop, selling like iPhones. It could be like selling like any popular thing. Uh, 
Uh, yep, basically. You the know, Matt detective says that's true. So, hmm. well, Matt, you know, interesting. Here's a, here's a bit of a trivia question for you. You may not know this. I used to work at a supermarket back in my high school days. Uh, big Y, shout out. Um, only the best from their family to yours. And uh, do you know what the most popular item we sold in the store? We sold more of this item than any other in the entire store. It was not hotcakes. I will tell you that. We did not sell hotcakes. We should have. We might have sold a lot of them. Um, bananas. Shit. Oh, my God. He gets to get, give this man a trophy. Whoa. <laughs> he crushed it. Very yeah. good. Yes, we sold more bananas than any other food item. That makes sense. Bananas are great. I, I They sell uh, like hotcakes. They do. Bananas sell like hotcakes. Mm-hmm. This is fun. This is fun. I I, I gotta keep I gotta this keep is, doing this. Well, I got uh, I got one for you, Matt. Uh, and this cool, is it's sure. an all time classic. It's raining cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. Do you, Do you know the origin of this one? Cats and dogs out there. I think it does. It come from an old Norse myth about cats and dogs falling from the sky because like Thor got really mad and cheated on his wife. All the gods and goddesses do that. Is that what was that where it came from? I mean, that's probably the most accurate wrong answer that we've given tonight. So, like, all right. So, so I would say Odin transformed himself into a dog to have sex with a cat. Thor found out about it, got really mad, and made it rain from the sky. Is that what happened? Sure, we can go with that. Uh, no, that no, that is not <laughs> correct. Uh, and actually, I give this is very funny, Matt, because. Uh, I don't, my parents really don't care. Well, no, they, they, they're proud of me that I do these shows, but they don't watch them and they don't really care what we do on them. Uh, but I did mention, I talked to my father this evening and I told him, uh, that we were doing the show. He said, Oh, what's the topic? I said, idioms. We're doing idioms. And out of nowhere, he goes, Oh, like it's raining cats and dogs. Do you know the origin? And my dad knew this one. So I got to give him the shout out for telling me the answer. Cause I didn't know it dates back to England in the 1500 when houses had thatched roofs. And in cold, foggy nights, it was commonplace for animals to get up on the roof to get warm. And so cats and other small animals like mice, bugs, and the occasional dog would wind up on the roof. And when it rained really hard, some of the animals would slip off the roof and either go through it or wash up in the gutters and fall onto the street. It was raining cats and dogs. Ah, very, very interesting. I don't interesting think we have that one. problem anymore. Mm, I beg to differ. You, are there a lot of cats and dogs up on your roof? Oh yeah, all the time. You have no idea. You have no idea. Cats, dogs, turtles, snakes, chinchillas. Yeah, it's, it's bad. The, yeah, you got a wildlife problem. I think so. It's a veritable menagerie, Sean. Oh God! Whoa! Hey, that's a that's a five dollar word right there. <laughs> Uh, how about this one coming to you live from the Oxford book of idioms? Um, how about, whoa, you're really mad, Sean. You oh. better cool down right now. You're flying off the handle. Oh, flying off the handle. Oh, of course. Uh, this one refers to, yeah. uh, I know this one actually. Uh, and this one refers to, uh, Joseph handle, Joseph handle, who uh, in the uh, mid-1800s, when he was very upset and very mad, he would get into his airplane and he would do aerial stunts. Um, and it became wow. quite a show. People would even purposefully get him mad to see his amazing aerial tricks. <laughs> uh, and, you, and, and you would be flying off with Handel, Joseph Handel, flying off with Handel and it became uh, flying uh, off the uh, Handel. But, but yes, he would do amazing the amazing aerial stunts of Joseph Handel. Uh, but only when he was mad. It was very odd. He was an odd man, but a great hero. You buy tickets to fly with Handel, flying off with Handel? Yes, exactly. And he would just fly you off places. You didn't know where you were going to go. No, well, but he was mad. So he'd get you, if he was like, if you had a fight with him, he'd get you in the plane and then like do crazy. You'd be like sick and nauseous and like, no, please don't kill us, you know. Uh, and he never would, but you'd be flying off the handle. Uh, I can't tell you how um, unimaginably accurate that was nailed it i knew i knew that one uh actually comes from not a person named handle but it comes from the handle of a um a certain tool that was very popular in the pioneer days of the united states um 
pioneers would always go out west with their trusty axes, their hand axes. These axes were not very reliable, so occasionally, due to poor design, would result in the head unexpectedly zooming off of its handle. Many people found this to be an apt metaphor for passionate bursts of rage, eventually birthing the phrase that we still use centuries later, to fly off the handle. Wow, that's a weird one. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if I buy this one. This is this is a strange one. Your BS meter's going off a little bit. Yeah. I all right, so you're chopping wood with your axe. Because it's hot out and you're doing a lot of work chopping, and all of a sudden, boom, you flip it when you the handle might fall when you flip it back, like to raise it above your head. It could fall on your head and make you really mad, or just the like the act of like it falls off and then you like go lunge forward and maybe fall could get you really mad. Mm -hmm. And off what happens when you fly off the handle. Hmm. It's very strange to, to make that connection and for that to have entered our language. But I like that, that to me, that makes me kind of appreciate this idiom even more. I feel like it's a little too specific only because when you like it's raining cats and dogs, like that probably happened to a lot of people's houses, like all across England. So I kind of get that, but like how specific is this where it's like people who did enough ax work and were angry this happened to and somehow it spread like i don't know it's just a little too vague i think it's it's just a matter of the like the notion like the work itself is making you mad and now all of a sudden your tool broke so you have to go buy another one which was probably really really expensive in those days because you were a pioneer and you had no money mm -hmm. and if you didn't buy another one like your livelihood was gone so all the really really mad Things were tougher back then. Probably made you want to go shoot a buffalo or two or three, 400. Well, you know, Matt, yeah. to replace that broken axe, it would probably cost you an arm and a leg, Matt. Do you know where the phrase cost you an arm and a leg came from? Um, why, yes, I do. And you would, back in the, in the, in the Middle Ages, would actually ask for for arms and legs as payment for uh, their services during the bubonic plague. They would take healthy arms and healthy legs, and they tried to amputate the sick arms and sick legs from people who had the bubonic plague and sew the healthy arms and legs back onto them in a kind of like Frankenstein to heal them of their plague. And they, so they took their arms and legs as payment. Which is cycle is what it was. I can think of like seven things that were, that were wrong. What you just said, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, points for effort. Um, no, Matt, turns out that is not the correct, that is not the correct answer. Uh, I don't know where they got all those healthy limbs, but um, maybe... Not they were painting the town red with limbs. Um, <laughs> but in case you're curious, costing an arm and a leg went back to paintings back when uh, there weren't cameras and everyone was painted. Believe it or not, and to me this is crazy, portraits were charged not by the number of people in the picture, but by the number of limbs that were painted. If you wanted a cheaper painting it would cost an arm and a leg. You had to charge more because it was more difficult to paint those. Um, and that is potentially part. Of it. I don't think it's the full reason. Part of the reason why they do those photos where like their hands are like in their shirt or like an arm is behind the back. It's, it's, it's simply to save on cost. Oh, really? That yeah. I did not know. Yeah. That's a fun one. I did not know that. So it would cost more money to paint their arms and legs. Yes. Rather than neck up. Okay. Yep. That was the, so that's why you don't see a lot of legs. It's all waist up or the, the hand in the jacket or behind the back or, you know, it was just, that's where the cost came in was the limbs. That's where they get you. Very, very interesting. Hmm. 
Okay. Uh, well, with that one, I think you just let the cat right out of the bag. Oh, no. Get that cat uh, back in that bag. Dude, I don't know if we can get it back in there. I don't know if we really want to get it back. Uh, we kind of lose the meaning of the idiom, which is what exactly? Oh, letting the cat out of the bag. Matt, this is a very interesting one. Uh, this goes back to um, the beloved Broadway musical Cats. It's a, it's a recent one. It's a recent one. This one this one isn't as old as some of these other ones. Um, it caught on very quickly. Um, and what happened was the uh, the creative mind behind Cats. Who's who's the guy who wrote Cats? Shit. the 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 famous the famous musical guy. Well, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Thank um, you. Um, yeah. Thank you for providing that one. Uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> um, he used to say because the idea had been in his head for such a long time. That uh, his mind bag, as Andrew Lloyd Webber famously called his 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 brain, his idea center, um, I mean, and he and he famously let cats out of the bag, out of his mind bag, um, mm. and and he he regretted it because he he was never happy with how it came out, and he always he always would tell people they'd say Andrew Lloyd Webber, if you have any advice you can give to the people out there about making musicals and being successful, what would you say? And you'd always say, don't let the cats out of the bag. Ah, he would, he, he would often be seen on, on a feverish, sleepish, sleep, sleepless nights. He would run through the streets exclaiming, get these cats back into my mind. <laughs> Free themselves from my mind bag, please. Somebody. Could you imagine? I'm sorry. Could you mind bag is open. Could you imagine you're sitting in the audience at a performance of Cats and just a nude Andrew Lloyd Webber just <laughs> runs on stage? Get in my get mind in bag. bag. You in my, my mind. mind. How'd bag. you get out of my mind get bag? Back. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, that's terrible. I almost wish that was true. That would be great. Almost wish that was true. Uh, contra actually, the, surprisingly, the wrongest thing that you may have said is that it's not an old idiom. In fact, this is one of the earliest idioms that uh, touches on our list, dating all the way back to the early 1500s. Cats would often serve as dudes in business transactions with farmers, particularly those with pigs apparently a um a cat-sized pig could be easily swapped for a stray cat um in a purchase because when they would when they when people would buy pigs sometimes if they were small enough they would put them in bags like uh like uh sackcloth type bags uh-huh um they would put them in the bags to so that the pigs would like go with them willingly, and it was just easier to kind of herd them that way. So sometimes people would put or uh, like a cat sized cat in the bag, and then the bag might escape, or the cat might escape from the bag. Thus, the saying "let the cat out of the bag." What? Uh, you 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 lost me somewhere in the middle there. So if I understand this correctly, uh, Farmer mm -hmm. Matt, uh, you and I are conducting a a transaction. I am perhaps purchasing one of your cat si your famous cat sized pigs that that you're just known all the world over yeah. for a pig exactly the same size and weight of a cat. Yep. And, yep. That's exactly right. And I uh, you I I give you my shekels. And you give me a burlap sack with some sort of animal in it. Yep. Which and, you believe to be a pig. But I don't look inside. That's really no. important. Like, I trust yeah. you. It's like, don't look a gift horse in the mouse. It's the same thing. It's rude for me to question your integrity as a businessman. So I don't look in the bag. I take it with me. And you get away with it. God forbid that cat ever got out of the bag. Because then I would know... You were right. ripping and then the me cat off. Would be out of the bag. That sounds like such bullshit. Holy <laughs> crap. That's garbage. That is the dumbest thing. I don't leave a McDonald's drive thru without checking what's in my bag, never mind buying a pig. That's crazy. Who 
whoever got away with that even <laughs> once i'm sure someone Apparently tried enough people did no stop that i don't believe that for a hot minute no one guy okay. tried it once and they're like what the hell is this this is a cat i did not buy a cat i wanted to buy a pig a cat sized pig so that was that was one theory, Sean. I, I found another theory oh, that good. may satisfy you because that, that evoked such uh, animosity from you. I decided to go ahead and look up the, another another uh-huh. origin story. I, this this one says that it may refer to the whip, the instrument of punishment once used on royal navy. Uh, the the instrument was reportedly stored in a red sack who revealed the transgressions of another would be letting the cat out of the bag, as in the cat o' nine tails. Um, so, like, to let the cat out of the yeah. bag is to take this whip out of the bag so the sailor would be whipped. Yeah, that's like a million um, times another- more plausible. Yeah. So actually, wait, wait, wait. I want to go back to the the first um, the first origin story. The, the Andrew first, Lloyd though, Webber the one. one? That you, apparently, this was a fairly common scheme. No, no, no. The one that you had <laughs> such exception with. Yeah, it's uh, from a, a, an actual like organized scam, which was called pig in a poke. Pig in a poke scam, originating in the late Middle Ages. Uh, the pig in a poke. A poke is a sack or a bag. Mm-hmm. So the scheme entailed the sale of a suckling pig in a poke or a bag. A pig in a poke. Suckling pig unopened and would actually contain, it would be sewed shut so that you couldn't physically open it. And inside would either be a cat or a dog, usually a cat which was substantially less valuable as a source of meat. I like how they added that because you could eat the cat or dog, but you wouldn't really want, you wanted that suckling pig. Mm -hmm. So uh, the French have an idiom called acheter en poche, to buy a cat in a bag is basically to get scammed. You bought a cat in a bag. Okay. Okay. And many European countries carry the same idiom. Bag is to get scammed. Um, but yeah, so that's the that comes from the the pig in a poke scheme. Okay, so just so I'm clear, right? So this is this is how it works: is I come up to you, Matt, and I say, Matt, and I've got this like small white box with no writing or labeling on it, and I say, Matt. I have a Rolex watch for sale, and I would like to sell it to you. It's worth $10,000, but I'm going to sell it to you for $5,000. The thing is, though, you can't open the box. You can't. Don't. Don't even What's try. in the box? No, it, it's, it's, it's totally a Rolex. Like, I'm very trustworthy, and, and, but it's only half the price. Are you telling me? You're going to give me $5,000 for a box you can't open. And then you get the box and you open it. And inside, a Rolex-sized cat. Bad idea. (laughs) Bad idea. Maybe we're a lot smarter now than they used to be. Like, I realize we're more educated and have technology and all this, but... Okay, so the bag, it's fastened shut. You're a medieval peasant. How are you going to open that bag? But are you going to be carrying a knife around with you when you go to purchase this from the farm down the road, which might even be like, well, not probably not that long, but like some time travel from your, from your own uh, little hovel. So I guess the only way. I, I so, guess. I guess the only way this makes sense to me is if people back then were so poor and so desperate, they're like, I hope there's a pig in this bag, but even if it's a cat or a dog or frankly a human baby, I don't care. I'm so hungry. I'll eat whatever it is. But that still is pretty (laughs) terrible. 
I mean, that's kind of what happens with me and McDonald's, where it's like, it's terrible, and I don't want it, but I'm hungry, and it's here, so I might as well just take it. Hmm. Yeah. It's a, it's a strange one, for sure. Be, I think it can be justified. Just be, just the fact that this scam is like a well-known scam that like probably many, many times See, is very interesting. I would rank the likelihood of accuracy of these origins in like most accurate is the whip in the bag. And then the second most accurate is Andrew Lloyd Webber's mind bag. And then the third most likely <laughs> is mind. the peasant scheme. <laughs> Get back in my Get mind in bag. My mind bag. <laughs> All these cats. Mind bag. This, uh, this may be th like the third best original character we've ever created on the show. Insane Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yes. Um, now, Matt, I got, we're, we're running out of time, so we can do maybe one or two more. I got a great one for you. Uh, do you know what it means to give someone the cold shoulder? Yes, actually. Uh, uh, a trend in, in um, Victorian England, uh, ladies would actually uh, take ice and put them and rub, rub it on their shoulder so that their shoulder would get very, very cold and red. You showed that red shoulder to someone, it meant that you were shunning them from society. It was a huge public disgrace to to give someone the cold shoulder. So what, would they take them and like put them in the town square and like pub you'd be publicly iced? It would be, yeah, the cold shoulder. Now I, I have an even better one. Okay. I just okay. I, I I I remember the real origin for this gotcha. one. Gotcha. Um there was a prankster, French village, and his name was Pierre Jean-Louis Poisson. And he would, Jean-Louis would, would run around to the, to the village people uh, with ice in his hands, and, and he'd sneak up behind them. He'd be very stealthy, and he'd, he'd rub the ice on their shoulder while they weren't looking, and then he'd run away. And they were like, oh, I've been given the cold shoulder. It grew to such enormous popularity, it's believed to have caused the French Revolution. Oh. Well, this is why the kids today are still running around giving people the cold shoulder. You know, youths yeah. today. Mm hmm The youths. So, why? Why? Oh, no, you were can, right. Can you, possibly, can you possibly disprove that? I don't know. Oh, no, you're right. I'm not even going to tell you the correct answer because you already said it. That would just be repeating something you already said. What a waste of time. We'll just move on. Well, uh, which one was it? Was it the, the, uh, the first... Well, you technically were closer. It does come from medieval England. So you actually were sort of on the right <laughs> path. Um, apparently, yeah. when uh, at when you had a guest over at your home and it was time for them to leave, today we just kind of awkwardly mill about and everyone's uncomfortable. Back then, if you wanted a guest to leave, you would give them a cold piece of meat from the shoulder of mutton, pork, or beef chop. Um, it was the polite way to communicate, you may leave now. Oh. Because you wouldn't eat it, right? If you served it hot, they would oh, think it was part okay. of the meal. Like, and it's something... They, yes, okay. exactly. Yes, you would, you would give them the cold uh, shoulder. Oh, okay. Which I'm going to start doing at my dinner parties. Absolutely. Just keep Absolutely. just like a just raw keep, piece of shoulder, just keeping it in the fridge. <laughs> just get... Don't say anything to them. Just just hand it to the to the person and just assume that and they'll And then just know. like turn the lights off and go what upstairs. Yeah, and go to bed. Yep. <laughs> and start rushing. Yep. <laughs> Like, did Sean just give mm -hmm. me the cold shoulder? The cold, gave you the cold shoulder. That's exactly right. Okay. Hmm. That's what we give on the show: real world yeah. life advice. Yeah, that's uh, that's helpful for sure. And uh, I, I recommend you try that at your next uh, your next dinner party. Impress your guests. A, co a cold shoulder makes a great gift all year round. There's one idiom that I really want to know the solution to. Okay. I think I just found it. Okay. I had to look it up real quick because I forgot. Okay. Okay. I think you said it in our little introduction. Mm -hmm. To throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
Yes. I really, really want to know where that came from because that's such a bizarre expression. Um, and I found the answer. Do, do you know the answer? Sean? Oh, if, Matt, I, I know the answers to all of these. I've been studying for weeks. Getting, pre You know how hard we prepare for the show. I wouldn't come unprepared not knowing the origins of these various phrases. Um, no, what this actually is from, of course, a lot of people know this. This is obvious. Um was that uh, back in the early part of the 20th century, um, there was a famous uh, pitcher, a famous baseball pitcher, okay? His name was Billy Bathwater. That was his nickname. He, that wasn't his real, but they called him Billy Bathwater because uh, he loved taking baths, but he was also a very good pitcher. And um, what it, in a famous game in the, in the 1936 World Series, Billy Bathwater was pitching, and what he did was um, he he threw the ball, and it was the it was the bottom of the ninth. Uh, the game was basically over, and uh, Billy Billy threw the ball, and the umpire called it uh, he called it a strike, and the game was over. But it was controversial <laughs> because it it was uh, because um, uh, 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 Jimmy Baby was up at the plate. You see, Jimmy Baby Jimmy was the batter. And baby's last name versus his nickname the baby. No, he was he no, he was Jimmy Jimmy the baby uh, Galenti. And so he yeah. was he was up there for for the uh whatever baseball team and he was up there at bat and um that's where the phrase comes from because Bathwater threw him out at the plate won the world series for the team. Turns out Bathwater the game was fixed. He was throwing it. And so that's where the phrase comes from. Wow. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Get it? Right. Don't throw him out. Only throw the bath water. Exactly. Because the because uh, it, it was illegal and it was wrong and he shouldn't have done it. Don't throw baby out with bath water who was the pitcher. We all you know, that notorious pitcher, bath water, he's Yes. Yeah. I, he was a bad dude, we all know. He's not he, he's, he's a, never gonna make it in the Hall of Fame. I think that's clear. I think he's permanently banned. From, oh, he was. No, the whole team. I mean that big scandal. I mean we all we all remember it. Disgusting. Yep. Almost destroyed the sport. They made a movie about it, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Yeah. Um, Was I right? <laughs> well, it turns out, I'm looking up here, uh, the origin, it says absolutely nothing about baseball it, uh, or, yeah. or a pitcher in bathwater. Huh. It's odd. This site has to say, it is Wikipedia, so who knows if well, it's read, true Read the not. wrong one, just in case people are curious. Um, but it, it says here that um, in the it comes from the 16th century Germany. Uh, it originates at a time when whole households would share the same bath water. Mm -hmm. uh, you would draw a bath, and the entire family would bathe in it one at a time. Uh, the head of household, the lord, would bathe first. Um, any of the men, so any of the male sons. Uh, then the lady of the house, then all the women, and then finally, the, then the children, and then finally, lastly, the mm, the we we lost Matt for a second there. I think that I think he was going to say baby. I think the baby bathed last, um, and that's where the phrase came from, because they would after the baby was done, they would throw out the bathwater. So. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to throw a baby out with the bathwater, which is, is, uh, go. yes. Thank you, Matt. I wrapped it up for you cause you were frozen for the whole end oh. of it, but I, I, I concluded it. Sure. Sure. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater that uh, you can't see the baby in it. There you go. Um, which is, I like which is baseball crazy. Story, though. I, I didn't know where that was going and it took some interesting turns and I didn't and know where it was twist. going. And it, I think it ended in a good place, so I, I'll take that one. Well, I just I don't get the like. Okay, I get the water was dirty and the babies were the last one to use it. But would you be like time, to, time, time to get rid of this dirty water? Oh my God, there's a baby in here! Like I don't. That's kind of a little a bit of a stretch. Hmm. Uh, another more interesting uh, origin here is that it, it kind of was a meme. It was like a very early meme. Um, it dates back to a 1512 woodcut 
uh, that showed a woman tossing out a baby with wastewater. It's right here uh, for those of you that are watching at home. Oh, look at that. Um, and the woodcut was apparently very popular with uh, among among um, the German crowd. And it basically was duplicated over and over again throughout German villages and towns. This image of this woman pouring out bath water and a baby coming out. It, it apparently was hysterical to these medieval Germans. So it was like a very early meme, basically. Wow. And the, the saying, don't throw the baby out with the bath water came from this, uh, this picture. Which I feel like image. that's, I feel like that's one people don't really use as much anymore. Like most of the ones I think we've talked about, people still use with some regularity, but don't throw the baby out. I can't think of anyone I know who s really says that. It's not as common. No. Uh, I prefer don't put the horse before the cart, which I think has, does it have the same meaning? No. Well, you said it. No, don't put the, don't put the <laughs> cart before the horse. Don't put the cart. You're supposed to put, put the, the horse, horse before, before. Yes, the cart. that's correct. Yeah. Yes. That's the right way to do it. That's a good one. People use that you one a lot. You would tell someone to put the horse before the cart or don't put the cart before the horse. There yeah. you go. Correct. Yes. I was yep. trying to think. So. Go ahead. Oh, so like, is that saying the same thing as throwing the baby out with the bathwater? I think it's don't get ahead of yourself is, is the, is the sort of purpose. Don't, don't, you know, if you're not paying attention and you're sort of rushing through things, you'll throw the baby out with the bathwater because you'll forget the baby was in the bath. Um, and I, uh, that's to me sort of the sort of practical use of the phrase, you know, don't, okay. don't Whereas get cart before the horse. It has to do with planning. Like, Yes. Don't, yes. Uh, don't rush into planning for something. Like take time to prepare and plan it out. Yep. Agreed. Think about your goal and visualize it. Well, there you go, Matt. That was, I, I can't believe we've done a whole hour of idioms. Maybe we're the idiots. Who knows? We're the idiots. We did it. We did it. I was going to say. I, I was going to went pretty well. And, uh, I learned I think, a lot. Yeah, it was, uh, I learned a lot. I hope everybody out there learned a lot. Um. Give somebody the cold shoulder and it can cost a little bit extra if you want your arms and legs painted. So that is very true. We learned about the story of famous MLB pitcher Billy Bathwater and uh, and Andrew Lloyd Webber's uh, probably syphilitic mind just going insane. <laughs> His mind back. Um, crazy, and the, uh, and the, the, the crazy, angry uh, Joseph Handel and his and his, and, and uh, and aerial, his, aerial, <laughs> his aerial tricks. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we did. We we really should do a creative episode where we write our own idioms. Yeah, I, I kind of like the idea of all these characters like interacting in a in a in the a idiom world. shared universe. Yes, I like this where people put cats in bags and <laughs> and it literally rains cats and dogs. Like this is an animated film franchise waiting. To, it's like cloudy with a oh chance God, of meatballs, but we're just crazy Cat shit happens. In the sky, somebody catches it in a bag. Yeah. Throws it up and tries to sell it like it's a pig. This is a really good idea. Trademark that. Mm -hmm. Trademark that. Um, but we are out yep. of time. We got to wrap up here. But thanks, everybody, for joining us. Hope you had as much fun as we did. Uh, and I know we had a lot of fun, so um, I'm sure you did as well. Our website, of course, is upfordebate.tv. You can go there and get all of our past episodes. You can uh, click the movies button and, and get an update on our movie league, uh, which Matt is leading very shortly this week. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I was just going to ask, uh, please tell the folks at home who is in first place. Guess what? Good thing. Spoiler alert. I think it, it's on my shirt. It's, it's the full Johnson. Spoiler alert. It's the full Johnson experience. Yeah. And edited by me. I'm, I'm glad we're recording this. So permanently the one week you were in first, we will have on record. And ever. No, he's his champion. His ego has broken his internet connection. Um, no, so um, so you can check that out all winter long at upfordebate.tv slash movies. And of course, all the links everywhere you can subscribe and get the show are all there on the website. And of course, at TV on Twitter and TV at gmail.com is our email address. Uh, that is going to wrap it up here. Uh, thanks everybody so much for joining us. We'll be back next time with more great discussion. We've, we've got 
some awesome stuff coming up in the next couple weeks. We got some book club picks we're working on. We've got awesome episode ideas for 2018. So it's going to be another great year uh, coming up, but we got to wrap up for tonight. So thanks everybody so much for joining us. We have Matt, this is Sean. We'll see you next time for more great discussion and fun times here on Up for Debate.